First episode giggles. Try again. All right, see it again. Hi, I'm Teresa. And I'm Ben. And this is Standing By with Ben and Teresa of More Selfa Expeditions. <clears throat> this is the show where you can hail us and ask us your questions, share your thoughts, just musings about the sea, whatever you want, because we're standing by, ready to take your call. And actually, we're not literally standing by because, you know, to hail us on the radio, you'd have to be within line of sight, 12 nautical miles, and you don't actually, so. and you don't actually know where we and are. The day and the weather. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead, you can just give us a call, and the number is 872-265-1818. Leave us a voicemail, and uh, we'll take your call there. Yeah, we were just at the Annapolis Boat Show, the Spring Boat Show, and um, we met a lot of great people at our booth, and uh, they had a lot of great questions. questions. What what questions did you receive? Oh, you remember please, any? I remember spot. one that I had. Um, somebody asked me to teach, to explain to their seven-year-old what a sextant was and how it worked. Right. That was fun. Yeah. And then I had another question. Someone challenged me to teach them a knot that they, they didn't, didn't know. know. So I, I taught them the Zeppelin to bend, which it technically isn't a knot. It's, it's a bend. bend, but it's my favorite one. And he didn't know it, so we kind of disregarded that technicality. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, knot is a loose term. People use it mm -hmm. to mean everything. Someone also asked me um, if they would meet their wife on a more self expedition. <laughs> <laughs> I think we Good mutually one. agreed that... Um, he would be better off going on Love is Blind than a more self-expedition. <laughs> Which will work. We're going to work that into the next season. <laughs> Something. Why don't you tune in the radio? All right. Here you go. <laughs> okay. So, uh, I'm going to get our channel 16. Standing by here. Hi, Dr. Morning Muster. This is Daphne from Southern California. And I was curious to ask, if you're going to get on board a boat with someone you've never really sailed with before, um, what is a good way to know or to kind of help? What's a good way to ask this? What's a good way to be a good crew member? I mean, beyond the obvious. And also, what should I expect from them? And what if you get somebody who's a real freak? And you're out in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> who, who goes overboard first? Um, anyways, I will take my answer off the air. Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, I was. Okay. Great the... question. Thank you. <laughs> I was really glad to hear her say, not only when she said, how can you be a good crew member? But I was really glad to hear her say, how do I know that this person is, is a good person, a person that I want to sail with? Right, that is a, a major issue, and that a lot of people are trusting. Yeah, oh, you own a boat; it's your boat, sure. I'll you probably, probably know what you're doing, but it's mm -hmm. not the case. Yeah, not the case. Um, you've been in a situation similar to that, haven't you? Yes. You talk about that. Or it's not? kind of hard for me to talk about because okay. the people I sailed with were nice people, good people. Yeah. I didn't actually go, end up going sailing with them, but. Um, I was supposed to do a big passage, and um, there were four of us on board, and I was deemed low on the pecking order. And uh, I didn't mind, but um, no one really asked me my experience, so how would they know? But um, anyways, I had a hard time in the days leading up to the passage of kind of feeling a little belittled, like... Um, I would ask, oh, do we need to buy more vegetables? Do we need to test the commute comm system? Do we need to do this? I'd like, and it would always be like, oh, don't, don't worry. It's going to be okay. Don't worry. Don't worry. And I'd be like, okay, I'm trying to be respectful. And I think I just let it go a little too far. I should have spoken up much sooner, but I did. One of the questions I did ask was I saw some uh, it was a brand new boat. I saw some streaks in a closet. And I said, should we check where this water is coming in from? And um, they had, it hadn't rained, but we had hosed the boat down. So, And they said, oh, it's okay. And um, I ended up getting off and not sailing with them. I got off the boat. I flew home the next day. I stayed in a hotel one night, flew home the next day. And they they left on their departure. I stayed with them to like help them get ready i kind of became like their task girl like you need something up sure i'll run to the store get that whatever 
Um, then you know, I was leaving, so that was mutual. It was fine. And then when I got home, you picked me up and you called me a soothsayer. You said mm, I was a that's right, fortune it took, teller. It took you 20 hours to get home or so. Yeah, because they had set sail and in less than a day turned around to go back because they it was des- they described it as water above the floorboards. Mm-hmm. And they ended up having leaky mass partners and they broke a stay. Yeah, they did. They broke a shroud or stay. I can't remember what it was, but something. The chain plates were leaky, right? Or something uh, like mass that. partners. Mass so. partners, yeah. Um, so I think for me, Daphne, this is a long-winded way to get to your answer to your question. Um, I think for me, and, and actually it doesn't answer your question, but I don't know if I could have vetted them better, but they were good people. They had experience. They had already crossed an ocean. Mm-hmm. And um, so, but I think in the, ta- in the days leading up, I had signs and um, I trusted my gut. It was the right choice. But what I wish I had done differently was spoken up in a different manner earlier rather than just, you know, so that they wouldn't treat me the way they did so that I would expect a, some sort of different way of communicating with them so that I would get the answers that I needed and maybe the problem would have been addressed. So mm-hmm. that's kind of my regret, but I feel like at the same time, that's also their responsibility too, especially if they're taking the lead on this. That's part of leadership is crew communications. Um, and so- oh, Well, I think and, one, one important aspect is that you had a few days to assess the situation. Yeah. So I think that's an important thing that you should do is, is give yourself right. three days maybe before the boat's scheduled to depart. To hang out. To get to know the boat, Prep get to the know boat. the crew and see if it's going to be a good fit. Don't just fly down the day before the expedition's going to leave because right. you won't that's have a good time point. to assess. That's a really good point. The other thing I always tell people is um, you can ask them for their resume mm-hmm. and for a most recent survey of the boat. Now, the re- most recent survey of the boat might have been a few years ago. And that's fine. You can ask them what you've done to address this or that. And um, I don't think, and you can ask them for a resume. And some people might not have a resume per se, but they might be able to list out like, well, here's the boats I've sailed. Here's how many years or days or whatever. It doesn't have to, you know, just in an email. I've done this, this, and this. And uh, like an informal resume. I don't think anybody whom you're entrusting your safety with mm-hmm. on their boat and their leadership I don't think anybody should ever feel offended by that. If they do, then then you'd be should be concerned that's, about an that's ego. A red flag right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you can ask for you can ask for those things, and um, and then also they can obviously ask for the same from you. Um, and then how do you be a good crew member? Or do you want to add more to that? And then no, I don't. That's good. And then the other part of her question was how to be a, a good, good crew, crew member. member. Well, actually, we know Daphne. <laughs> And I would sail with you. (laughs) Um, I think to be a good crew member is just to be um, a good communicator. The the most important thing, I would say, is to to not hold back on what you're feeling. Because if you hold that in and you let it burst its bubble, that's when Yeah, that's when you get angry and things like that. That's a problem. So even if you just have a you know, and I should take this lesson too. Like, even if you just have a small issue, you know what, you know, one thing that we do when we sail with new co-instructors or something like that, we always say, okay, we're going to do feedback every day between the two instructors. And even when Benji and I were sailing together, we would do that with each other, even though we were married, it was always like, what's one thing you did great. And what's one area of improvement. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's not, it's not a criticism. It's an area of improvement because it's comes from the belief that we're all here trying to do the best that we can and that we can all be amazing. And um, so it's a gift. And um, it's a gift, right? And so oftentimes people I've sailed with, especially like if I'm the one in charge, I'll be like, okay, do you have feedback for me? What's the what's something I did well? What's the area of improvement? They get to the area of improvement. And they're like, I don't have anything. It was great. Right. And I always say to them, okay, it's the first day. You get a pass yes. today, but that's it. And every day after that, there has to be an area of improvement. And even if that person has done really great, there's always room for improvement. It doesn't mean they've done something bad. It just means like, oh, maybe I saw you're really good at this. So I'd like to see you do more of that. Or um, I don't know. That's... Mm-hmm. Yeah, the area of improvement. Sometimes I have to actually work at it during the day and try to think of things or you know, take good notes on people to <laughs> look for areas of improvement. But it's it's a valuable thing to do to share and it gets the lines of communication open 
Mm-hmm. It keeps them open. If you do regular check-ins like that, mm-hmm. that way when there is an issue that arises, you're already used to communicating. You've built up uh, a system that works. And it becomes welcome. Yeah. It's not like, okay, now I got to talk to him about this issue. I have an issue with you or, you know, and then it be, it's harder to hear. Mm-hmm. But if you've already established this routine of area of improvement every day, then when it's time to say the hard stuff, it's easy. It's easier. <laughs> it's a I wouldn't gift. say it's easy. It's a um, gift. As far as being a good but it com- But it comes from the belief that we're all out here trying to do the best that we can and that we all could be great. That's right. And I think that's an important point is that we are all out here trying to do the best we can. Yeah. I think that's what makes you a good crew member is that you're always trying to do the best you can. Even if you mess up or you're not, you don't know a lot of things. If you're open to learning and, and trying new th- and trying to learn as much as you can, then you, and do all the chores that are required. There's a lot of chores yeah. that are required on a boat. And if you're lazy, it's not going to work. And if you're not willing to learn, it's not Yeah. Going to work. I want to add one other thing that would make a good crew member. Yeah. Even if you don't know any technical skills at all, it's really important that you can make yourself comfortable. So stay dry. Stay warm, stay hydrated, stay, stay sunscreened, sleep when you're supposed to sleep so that you can be awake when you're supposed to be awake. So just make sure you are physically comfortable. Mm-hmm. Eat your food. Yeah, John Kretschmer told us a, a long time ago that when you're off watch, the only place you should be is in your bunk. Sleeping. Yep. So that when you're on watch, you're capable of doing what you need to do. That's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Thanks, Daphne. Yep. All right, should we uh, see Next question, more? tune yeah. it in. Let me see. Okay, third and hopefully final brain dump coming inbound. But yeah, you know, uh, I think it's cool that I'm going to have this amazing um, woman sailor on board who I also know teaches like leadership courses or something. And it's just going to be hopefully a really cool experience for, you know, not only me, but my daughter as well. Uh, I'm really looking forward to getting to know the boat under, you know, some interesting conditions. I mean, I really hope it actually gets a little rocky and rolly out there. And, you know, I get to experience what it means to really have to reef and, and you know, really, you know, get to know the boat under, you know, some spirited conditions and that kind of thing. So, yeah, you know, I'm just looking forward to getting her home into the home waters and then really getting to know her. And then spending a hell of a lot more money at the end of the season on, you know, solar, and, you know, potentially putting on uh, hardware for a storm jib, and I guess she'll become a flutter at that point, right? Is that what it is? When you convert a sloop into a kind of like a cutter by adding it in a force day and uh, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, this is going to be awesome. It's going to be a cool boat. I don't care what anyone says about production boats. Janos have been to the Antarctic. Janos have been to the Arctic. Janos have been in the Southern Sea. You know, it's not a quote-unquote blue water cruiser. And I'm like, well, what the hell is all that? So, you know, there is a lot of snobbery in the community. But you know what? I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be sailing. And it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be kick-ass. And you guys are great. And I look forward to sailing with you guys. Hopefully, I'll be chasing you on your expeditions this season. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Oh, shit. <laughs> all right, Martin. Thank you for the call. Awesome. <laughs> I didn't recognize his voice at first. Yeah. Yeah, it's Martin, right? Yes. Yeah. Martin sailed with more self-expeditions last, last year. Yeah, last September. And then this year, this voicemail was left before his trip. Yeah, he just so it's been a while. bought this boat and brought it up to Maine from Connecticut. And he did a passage with one of our former more self-expeditions instructors, yeah. Arista, Arista, who's pretty yeah. awesome. Um, and they had an interesting tale. Yeah. Do you, do you remember the details? I only saw a Facebook post, but it sounded like they hit a they whale. They hit a whale. Uh, yeah. Uh, Stellwagen Bank, I believe. Scary. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. That kind of thing is like, you know, you can sort of predict the weather and get pretty close. You can predict, you can, you know, where the rocks are and you can predict mm-hmm. the Use currents the charts, yeah. and all of those things, you have a lot of information, but you don't with no, whales. No, where the whales are, they're not charted and they're not sending out any radar signals. Pretty scary. Yeah. But yeah, it's exciting to hear about our former I, students getting out there and doing it, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I think I would have had a hard time sleeping after that. After that. 
Yeah. Yeah, but you know, I think those whales are kind of in an isolated area, Stellwagen Bank. Right. I mean, yes, they are in the Gulf of Maine. And here they and there. can go anywhere. Yeah, but um, they've come up in Penobscot Bay. Yeah. That's true. So. It is something that we, I know we've sailed by really close to a bunch of them. Oh, really like close. Like so close. So you're like, wow, how did we not hit them? Right. The cool thing is you can smell them. If they're feeding and that sort of thing, if they're near the surface, they're often blowing the, you know, their air holes are blowing smelly, smelly bad breath. <laughs> and you can smell the whale. So, you, you know, when you're on watch and you start to smell that weird smell, you can yeah. get on the lookout for them. But I've never bumped a whale. Thank God. I have been ramped uh by a shark twice ran by a shark a shark rammed our boat oh, really? twice remember our boat yeah i don't remember one was rasinante and i was oh i on... remember getting rammed by tante tante Tant Tanti one was tante so Ra rasinante was one i was at the bow standing bow watch with the beam gun and i saw this thing swimming towards us and uh... i was like well there's a shark and i was like whoa it's still coming and then interesting so at night where was this <sighs> it was in Maine. <laughs> okay. Um, Offshore a little bit? No, because we were coming into harbor. I we see. were coming into Anchorage. That's wow. why I was standing bow watch. Wow. I was shining with the beam gun. I was shining the the buoys, the channel markers. So perhaps it was attracted to the light. Maybe. Well, cool. Yeah, I hope we get to see Martin this summer on this boat. <laughs> let's see if we have another question. Let's, let's check tune it. Tune it in. Let's check it. You can tune it. <laughs> Just the squelch. Hi, Ben and Teresa. My name is Karen, and my husband and I took a part in a trip in 2022. Uh, since then, we purchased a Pacific Seacraft 40 and have enjoyed learning all the systems. But we have two questions for standing by. Um, the first one is that... Um, we purchased a Pacific Seacraft 40 that came with a boom brake but no preventer, and we would like to rig up a preventer system similar to Rosinante. Um, so how should we rig the preventer? The second question is that our boat came equipped with a nice running backstay setup, and we wonder under what conditions should we use it. Uh, we are using a Yankee this year, and therefore the stay sail cutter rig more frequently and we want to know what the best practice is for using a running backstay. Thank you for uh, answering our questions, and uh, we look forward to hearing your answers. Thanks. Bye. Those are great questions. I love this technical stuff. <laughs> um, okay, cool. You good with this? Yeah, so um, she wants to know about a preventer. Yeah. Yeah, specifically our preventer. Yeah. They like They like the setup. And running backstays. Right. Let's start with the running backstays real quick. So running backstays, they have a cutter rig on their Pacific Sea Craft. So they have an inner four stay. And anytime they fly a sail so on the inner So let's break this down stay, with cutter rig real quick sure. what this means. And that forward triangle from the mast to the four stay, that's where your jib is going to be. Yeah. And then if you have a second sail. Second stay. A second stay, a little bit, a little bit smaller. Further aft. That would be where your staysail is. And if you fly those two sails at the same time, we call that a cutter rig. Um, so I think that whenever you're using that inner four stay with a sail on it, then you should definitely have the running back stay set. When you're whenever you're using the stay sail. Yes, whenever you're using the stay sail. Yes, what I said? because I don't. I wasn't paying attention. Okay. I was seeing a seeing alert on your computer that says "Go practice drums." <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> uh, uh, so hold on a second. Here's the reason why. Like you, if this is the mast and this is the four stay for the jib. Yep. And here's your inner four stay. Your inner four stay. Your running back stays are usually balanced exactly where that inner four stay is. Yes, they should both attach at the same point off the mast. So yeah. you're you're counteracting that force pulling the mast forward, the bending of the mast forward where, where the staysail is attached. Yeah, That's with all that mast. pressure on the staysail, all the wind. Yeah, starting to pull your mast forward into the running back stays, you know, uh, opposing that force. Yeah. To keep the mast from bending. So an easy rule of thumb is you fly the uh, staysail, fly the running back stay. Yes. Basically. And you only need one. You do the opposite one Correct. of what shepherd. If your sail is on the port side, you'll do the starboard running back stay and vice versa. Yes, one one at a time. Okay. So that's the rule of thumb. That's the rule of thumb. Once you set Easy. the staysail, set your running back stay. Yep. Um, and the other one was the preventer. 
So the thing about the preventer that I just want to add a caveat here before we explain our preventer a little bit more is that every boat's different and where your stanchions or where your cleats or where your winches are mounted are even different, even if you have the same exact boat, perhaps. So it's not like yeah. our setup is best for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's a great setup. I love it. I saw it somewhere and I just mimicked it and I can't remember where I saw it, but it doesn't actually use any stanchions. That's a really important part because stanchions are not built to take those kind of loads. Stanchions are just built to hold the lifelines and keep you from falling over the side of the boat. And often if you do actually fall into them, you may bend them. They're not built super strong. They only have four little bolts at the bottom holding them on. And it's a lot of torque if you push on the top of them. Um, so we don't need stanchions. There is a dedicated pad eye, um, like you said, Probably half, near the stanchion, base of the stanchion. Yeah, near the stanchion base. It's on our cap rail and it's roughly, I would say three quarters of the way from the mast to the bow. It's pretty far forward. Three quarters right. of the way towards the bow. Um, we put a, uh, low friction ring in there so that the line coming from the end of the boom goes through the low friction ring and straight back to a cleat near the cockpit. It's mm. not, not running through any stanchions or any fair leads. It goes straight back. So there's only one chafe point, which is that low friction ring. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say something real quick before you continue on. If this is too technical, after you're done explaining that, I want to explain like what is a preventer and oh, why yeah. we need one. Right. So. Okay. Glad uh, we should have done that first, but okay. it's coming. So that is one line, but the cool thing about this preventer setup is that you don't have to take that line and tie it to the boom. On the boom, there are two lines, one on either side of the boom, port and starboard sides, permanently attached to the boom, to the end of the boom. And they run forward to nearly the gooseneck where the boom attaches to the mast. So that when you're standing on the side deck, um, close to the cockpit, we have a center cockpit, so it's really close to the cockpit, um, right near the masts, you can reach those jumper lines, or I forget what we call them, um, those lines that are permanently attached to the boom, you can grab that, I use a bungee cord just to keep it taut, I unhook it from the bungee cord, and I tie it into that other line that's running forward to the low friction ring and back to the cleat. This is a lot to follow. It is a lot to follow, a, a picture would really help. If we have one, we'll put it in the video. If we don't have one, we'll take one this summer and share it I, on I, the future. I have some. I have some. <laughs> so uh, that's really the key to this. And we use a, I have a splice in that jumper line, which is uh, Dyneema, by the way. I have a splice there, and I just do a single sheet bend into that splice. <sighs> Very simple. This was a lot. Like, yep. I was trying to picture it as you were explaining it. And I've seen it, obviously, mm -hmm. and I've I've done it, mm -hmm. but um, to me, it's not it's I, it's one of those things that like it makes sense. You're trying to pull the boom forward or hold the boom forward, or, you know. So it made sense. It makes sense when I'm out there doing it, and you explaining it right now is harder for me to picture. Yeah, it, it really needs a picture, and then it becomes very clear. Yeah. So I have a picture. I can throw it up. But let's explain what you need a preventer, preventer for. for. Right. So a preventer is, uh, simply put, you rig a preventer when you're sailing downwind to prevent your boom from swinging over in the event of an accidental jibe. Yeah. From swinging all the way from one side all the way out, all the way to the other side. That would be a big swing. And with all that rigging and gear and, and stress, it could be potentially break a lot of things or hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. Especially, per, for example, if you have your running backstay set up. Mm. You're flying a reefed main and your staysail, jibs furled up because you've got 25 to 30 knots of wind, for example. Mm -hmm. And so you've got that, let's just say in this case, your port side running backstay and you let the mainsail out to starboard all the way and a wave rolls you and that boom it just... catches some wind yep, swings. Yeah, catches a little wind and the rolling of the boat helps that boom swing across it's right into your running back stay gonna break something and we don't want that to happen no but i will also say like having a preventer 
Um, it helps, but you still don't want to accidentally jive because mm -hmm. you're still going to back win that sail. It's still going to lean you over. It's still going to be a little bit chaotic for a moment to get your steering back under control. So you don't want to accidentally jive. So you got to keep an eye on that jib and, or not the jib on the main sole. And you can start to see in the, um, leech of the sail, if there's a little bit of wind getting behind it, mm -hmm. you're getting too close to accidentally jiving. And if there's a lot of waves pushing your boat around and you're doing this yeah. slalom type of thing, then um, I would, you know, not even do a run. I would do, head up a little I bit. would head up a little Me bit. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Just to be safe. You know, we tack our way upwind. Why can't you jibe your way downwind instead of being so close to that accidental jibe? Yeah. You'll actually sail faster. So. Let's see how more. And safer. Is. Yeah. And safer. Correct. And, and. When we when we get on a sailboat, we don't do it to go fast, or at least us cruisers. <laughs> the cruisers don't do it to go fast. We want to get there safe. Yeah, when we want to go fast, we'll buy a motorboat. <laughs> we want to go. I wouldn't say fast. I would say efficient. Efficiently, safely. Yeah, the the fastest you can make your boat go, but with safety, and sometimes more comfort in mind. Mm hmm. Okay, sounds good. So that's standing by. Now you have the number. Uh, we'll put it in the description. So just call and leave us a voicemail. We'll listen to it. We'll, we'll answer, answer questions. It. We'll chit chat. Anything you want to say, we're standing by. <laughs> yep. Okay. These, these, this is Ben and Teresa standing by. On. <laughs> what channel are we on? Uh, let's see. <laughs> All right. Cool. <laughs>